Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Kerma. As one of Africa's earliest civilizations, the capital of the Kerma culture was founded at least 5,500 years ago in what is now Sudan. Today, it's one of the largest archaeological sites in the sub-Saharan region known as ancient Nubia, which was known for its gold deposits, incense, ivory, and architecture. By 1700 BC, Kerma was home to at least 10,000 residents. At its peak, it was the region's most powerful urban center, boasting a royal audience hall, a palace, a mud-brick temple, funerary temples, chapels, and so much more. Pottery and other items that the Kermans left behind are culturally distinct from those found in Egypt and other neighboring kingdoms. Kerman artifacts have been found more than 200 miles from Kerma, reflecting the society's far-reaching ties with other groups. But the 30,000 graves in the city's cemetery show that the civilization was not entirely free of outside influence. The Kermans adhered to a social hierarchy that may have been influenced by how the ancient Egyptians structured their society. Large tombs were surrounded by smaller burials, and some of the Kermans' royal burials feature images of the god Horus and other Egyptian deities, as well as Egyptian pottery, amulets, and scarab seals. For a time, Egypt and Kerma traded both material goods and cultural ideas. However, at some point, their relationship worsened, and the Egyptians sacked the city around 1500 BC. Kerma was absorbed and went on to serve as the headquarters for several of the new kingdom's rulers. Nineveh The ancient Assyrian city of Nineveh was located on the outskirts of Mosul in what is now Iraq. It was established as early as 6000 BC during the late Neolithic period. Over the years, it became a major religious center devoted to the Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar. It was built along a fault line, and so the walled city experienced numerous earthquakes, including one that destroyed the temple to Ishtar. Nineveh, nevertheless, became a great cultural and educational hub, serving as the capital of the Assyrian Empire for the majority of its existence. It grew to include parks, aqueducts, canals, an 80-room palace, and a library that housed 30,000 tablets. People continuously inhabited Nineveh for thousands of years, and in the 50 years leading up to its demise, it was the world's largest city. In 612 BC, a coalition of allied forces got angry and sacked and razed the ancient urban center. The intruders massacred and deported residents in large numbers. Nineveh never recovered from the construction, but it continued to function as a city in the centuries following the devastating invasion. It fell under the control of various civilizations, including the Seleucid Empire, the Parthian Empire, the Sasanian Empire, and finally the Arabs. By the 13th century, the city was reduced to mostly ruins. Today, it consists of two large mounds and the remains of Nineveh's massive stone and mud-brick wall that was built around 700 BC. Sadly, what little is left of the settlement is being destroyed by time, weather, looters, and terrorists. Mergar Located west of modern-day Pakistan's Indus River Valley, an archaeological site known as Mergar contains some of South Asia's earliest known evidence of farming and herding. The 300-acre Neolithic settlement sits at the foot of the Bolan Pass, which has long served as a connection between the Indus Basin and the Iranian highlands. Mergar was settled as early as 7000 BC, thousands of years before the famed Indus Valley civilization appeared in the region. It went through eight distinct periods of occupation, with the first inhabitants being a semi-nomadic pre-pottery culture who built mud-brick homes, planted grains, and raised sheep, goats, and cattle. They memorialized their dead with elaborate burials, laying the deceased to rest with baskets, pendants, tools, and other valuable objects they had at the time, like seashells, limestone, turquoise, and sandstone. During the second phase of occupation at Mergar, people began making ceramic pottery and the potter's wheel was introduced, significantly increasing production. The oldest human figurines in South Asia were unearthed in large numbers at the settlement, and the arrival of copper technology helped to greatly expand the site between the fourth and seventh phases of occupation. There was a lot going on here. The Mergar site was abandoned sometime between 2600 and 2000 BC, during its seventh period of occupation. Its residents re-established a new settlement five miles away in the larger and more fortified town of Naushado. 
French archaeologists discovered Mergad in 1974 while searching for the root of the Indus Valley civilization. While little is known about the ancient people who lived here, it's clear based on the evidence that they were advanced for their time and worshipped a god of some sort. Research into these ancient cities also shows that the developments like agriculture and raising livestock do not have a single origin, but developed independently in various places. It's shout out time! Big thank you to David Cat and Brenda Mosher for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. The Etruscans What we know today as Italy's Tuscany region was once called Eritrea. It was home to one of the most advanced societies that ever existed outside of Greece in the ancient world. The earliest known traces of the Etruscan civilization date back to around 900 BC, and the oldest examples of their writing originated around 700 BC. Sadly, their texts did not survive into modern times, and the closest scholars have gotten to a first-hand look at what their world was like has been through Greek and Roman sources. Even the top experts on Etruscan history only partially understand the language. There are complications that come with trying to learn about an ancient society based on what other cultures wrote about them, as you can imagine. At their peak, the Etruscans covered a large area of Italy. They learned how to mine metals, such as copper and iron, and this gave them an edge over other societies around them. They were wealthy, educated, artistic, and powerful. There is ongoing debate as to how much the Etruscans influenced Roman civilization. Rome's early kings may have been Etruscan. Ultimately, though, the Etruscan civilization fell because of increased threats from all around. They resisted the emerging power of the Roman Empire for as long as they could, but eventually surrendered. They were granted Roman citizenship around 90 BC, and in the following decades, their territory was incorporated into the Roman Empire. The Khmer The Khmer Empire occupied modern-day Cambodia between the 9th and 15th centuries. Its capital, Angkor, served as its powerful center. At its peak, the civilization ruled over a vast swath of Southeast Asia, including what is now Vietnam, Thailand, and Laos. The Khmer were among the first ancient civilizations to develop a road system with bridges. They also built canals, hospitals, and defensive works, like stone walls, which made them extremely good at preventing foreign invasions, at least for a while. Their deeply religious Hindu-Buddhist society was extraordinarily wealthy and mostly self-sufficient. Satellite imagery shows that between the 11th and 13th century, Angkor was the pre-industrial world's largest urban center. The Khmer Empire started to decline noticeably during the 14th century, and in the 15th century, the civilization had dissolved. Historians don't really have just one answer. Numerous events likely contributed to its downfall, including internal power struggles, tense relations between elites and rulers, frequent civil wars, wars with outside powers, plague, and declining harvests. Cucuteni Tripilia Around 5,500 BC, the Neolithic Cucuteni Tripilian culture became well known when its inhabitants spread across what is now Eastern Europe, including Russia, Moldova, and Ukraine. They built Neolithic Europe's largest settlements, with populations numbering anywhere from 20,000 to 46,000. Archaeologists have discovered that they did something strange. Every 60 to 80 years, the civilization burned down its structures and built a new spot at the same site. Their phases of occupation can often be seen at archaeological sites like Poduri in Romania, where there are 13 distinct layers, containing the ruins of settlements that were burned down and then built on top of. Researchers haven't figured out why the Cucuteni Tripilians did this, but it limited the amount of artifacts they left behind, to say the least. The civilization also left no signs of a written language. As a result, experts have very little to learn about them from. The few relics that were found intact include clay totems, copper tools, and spiritual objects. In the late 19th century, the first Cucuteni Tripilian communities were found. Recent findings reveal that the obscure culture played a bigger role in human advancement than it's given credit for, but because of their habit of destroying the evidence, we'll probably never know the true extent of their knowledge or capabilities. The Giraffed Culture During the 3rd millennium BC, an early Bronze Age civilization called the Giraffed Culture emerged in what is now Iran's Halil River Valley. 
They built a sprawling urban settlement that was surrounded by mountains on three sides and consisted of two large burial mounds, a fortified citadel, and numerous smaller buildings. The Giraffe people enjoyed a sophisticated lifestyle and a complex social hierarchy that put them ahead of other societies of their time. They practiced a religion and crafted vases, statues, and other fine goods. The civilization peaked sometime between 2500 and 2200 BC, after which point they experienced some sort of decline and abandoned their city. Over time, the villages they left behind were either buried in the sand or forgotten. After being rediscovered during the early 20th century, the Giraffe sites were excavated several times. In the meantime, they fell victim to looters, leaving behind a very limited array of artifacts, so we know very little about them. What we do know is that they were a distinct group with their own unique language, spiritual beliefs, architecture, and a writing system consisting of geometric figures. Many researchers believe that the society may be one of the so-called cradles of civilization, representing one of the first places on Earth where a complex culture developed. Some even speculate that the Giraffe culture was just as great as the Sumerians, or ancient Mesopotamia. The Vinca Civilization Also known as the Danube Valley Civilization, the Vinca Civilization was a Neolithic culture that lived throughout parts of southeastern Europe, including what are now Serbia, Kosovo, Bulgaria, Romania, and Macedonia. Dating as far back as 7000 BC, the Vinca are widely considered to be the cradle of European civilization. They made numerous advancements that put them far ahead of other cultures at the time including building some of the region's largest prehistoric settlements, fueling a population boom, and further developing farming after it was introduced in the area. In addition to planting crops and raising livestock, the Vinca plowed their fields and used copper silverware 1,000 years before doing so became common in Europe. They were not politically unified, however they preserved cultural solidarity by exchanging ceremonial items over a huge network of villages. The Vinca used a collection of around 700 symbols, including zoomorphic and anthropomorphic figures. Some scholars consider it to be one of the world's oldest writing systems. Layers of evidence found at some Vinca spots indicate a period of occupation lasting over 1,000 years. Their reasons for eventually abandoning these sites remain a mystery. The Aksumites The Aksumite Empire is one of the least documented civilizations. Historians know little about it, and the reasons for its collapse are a mystery. From around 80 AD until it met its mysterious downfall in 825, they occupied Eritrea and Ethiopia, as well as parts of Djibouti, Somalia, and Somaliland. The Kingdom of Aksum gained its power as a major player along a commercial trade route linking the Roman Empire with ancient India. Using its far-reaching political power, it influenced societies as far away as the Arabian Peninsula, which was located across the Red Sea. Aksum was also the first sub-Saharan empire to mint its own coins and adopt Christianity. During the early 7th century, the Aksumites stopped making new currency. Around the same time, residents were forced to flee inland, where they sought refuge on higher ground from some sort of upheaval. The capital was abandoned and resettled at an unknown location. According to legend, a Jewish queen named Yorit, or Judith, ordered the burning of Aksum's Christian churches around 960, but many historians question whether this story is true or if Yorit even existed to begin with. Another story claims that a pagan queen from a rival tribe named Bani al-Hamwiya was responsible for ending the Aksumites' power. Climate may have also been a factor. During the first century it rained more than usual, increasing the region's food supply, but there was a huge population to support and it's possible that the land could no longer handle the intense farming that was required to keep people fed. Mycenaeans The Mycenaeans were Greek-speaking immigrants who arrived in the Aegean region around 2000 BC and subsequently conquered the Minoans after living alongside them and trading with them for some time. The newcomers harvested food from the sea and grew grapes and olives in the dry, rocky soil. They frequently raided other societies, like the Hittites and Egyptians. The Mycenaeans built heavily fortified settlements, and through their plundering they became wealthy, and the civilization flourished between 1600 BC and 1200 BC, before unexplainably collapsing at its peak, when people began leaving the region in droves. 
Some scholars concede that we may never know why the Mycenaeans disappeared. There are numerous theories, including the realistic possibility that the society's violence against others finally caught up with it. Natural disasters, possibly including an earthquake and or a volcanic eruption, may have also ended the civilization. Drought, famine, civil uprising and financial devastation are also possible factors. The Shu Kingdom The Shu Kingdom was one of the very first highly advanced societies in ancient China, and just recently, Archaeologists have discovered even more remarkable things in the Sanqingdui ruins in China's southwestern Sichuan province. They found a bronze altar and a carved dragon with the nose of a pig in sacrificial pits. Archaeologists announce these as significant discoveries, although there have been way more things found over the years. Thousands of artifacts, including strange figurines carved like aliens, and jade relics have been pulled out of nearly a dozen sacrificial pits, and researchers are still trying to make sense of it all. The Shu Kingdom ruled this great city about 4,500 years ago. They made great headway with architecture and art and flourished for about 2,000 years. Then they mysteriously vanished and their city was abandoned. A farmer rediscovered the city in the 1920s, and since excavation started in the 1980s, about 13,000 artifacts have been found. What's truly amazing is that these people made sculptures unlike anything else made by any other civilization. Zhao Hao, an associate professor at Peking University, calls their art style complex and imaginative, and says their sculptures reflect the mystifying fairy world that they believed in. Others think their curious style of artwork came from an unexpected meeting with extraterrestrials thousands of years ago. Perhaps the most mysterious thing of all is that even though the Shu Kingdom was so advanced, they didn't leave behind any written records. We can only guess at what was happening in one of China's first great civilizations, up until they left 3,000 years ago. Some scholars believe it was an earthquake that caused them to abandon the city and move to Jinsha, where a new culture emerged, the people of the canyon. The Grand Canyon is 277 miles long and up to 18 miles wide in some places. It's arguably the most beautiful and exotic place in all of the United States. And according to some, it was also once home to a secret underground civilization. We don't actually have any proof that this civilization exists, other than a vague report in a newspaper from 1909. An explorer and anthropologist who supposedly worked for the Smithsonian Institution, a man by the name of G.E. Kincaid, discovered a group of strange caverns through an almost inaccessible entrance located halfway up a canyon wall. Inside the cavern was evidence of an ancient society. Statues made of stone, granaries full of seeds, copper weaponry, and enough space to fit about 50,000 people. Even stranger is the fact that the artifacts didn't appear to match anything on record. They looked nothing like artifacts left behind by the native Hopi Indians who have lived in the area for thousands of years. The explorers reported that the objects appeared to be Egyptian or even Tibetan, but there is no evidence the Egyptians ever made it to North America. Plus, why would they have lived in this small cave and not gone out into the actual canyon lands? It's a huge mystery and one that has never been solved. The Smithsonian Institution has no record of Kincaid, nor do they support the idea of Egyptian artifacts in the Grand Canyon. Most people believe it to be a hoax, a made-up story on par with Area 51 and its underground prison of aliens. The Fianna In Irish mythology, there is arguably nobody more important than Finn McCool. He may have been a real person, or maybe he wasn't. It's hard to tell with myths that are this old, but according to the stories that have been passed down from generation to generation, Finn was the first ruler and greatest of the Fianna, a group of tribal warriors who roamed from Ireland to the Isle of Man. These warriors hunted in large bands throughout the Iron Age and all the way into the early Middle Ages. They lived in the wild, hunted and raided small communities. They were basically like nomadic mercenaries. However, it's extremely difficult to separate fact from fiction here. There are thousands of tales of the Fianna, both fantastical and some more rooted in reality. Most scholars believe it was actually a rite of passage to join the Fianna, 
and one could only settle down and become a farmer after they had spent their youth pillaging. One thing that's for sure is that the Fianna existed in some capacity or another. We know they were raiding Britain at the end of Roman rule when the British Isle was plunged into chaos. And according to History of Ireland, written in the 17th century by Geoffrey Keating, the Fianna were actually respected by the nobility. During the winter months, British nobles would feed and house the Fianna in exchange for their warrior services. But in the summer and autumn, they would flee back into the wild and raid whomever they pleased. The Tartessos Civilization The Tartessos Civilization existed way back in the 9th century BC in southwestern Spain. They prospered for about 300 years along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. But what's really fascinating is that even to the ancient people of Europe, Tartessos was considered a place of great riches and legends. Even in the 1st century BC, not long after the Tartessos had vanished, adventurers made journeys to the area in hopes of finding lost cities. It was to the people of antiquity what places like El Dorado and Atlantis are to us today. Interestingly enough, the wealth of this advanced civilization was even mentioned several times in the Bible. The people of Tartessos were supposedly great builders. They had amassed a huge fortune through unknown means, and they were wildly powerful. But we didn't actually find any physical trace of them until near the end of the 20th century. Only recently did we find the remains of their cities. What archaeologists have been able to put together is a brief timeline of this lost culture. They believe that Tartessos were actually just the Phoenicians who started populating the Spanish coastline in the 9th century BC. The mining was so good in the area that they traded precious metals across the world and became extremely wealthy. They became so wealthy that the region of Tartessos took on a legendary status, completely removed from the Phoenicians themselves. That being said, researchers do say there was likely an indigenous group living in the area, who very well may have been the real Tartessos culture, although they would have gotten rich along with the Phoenicians from trading. Everything started going downhill in the 6th century BC for unknown reasons. Archaeologists have found abandoned villages that existed for less than 50 years, mines that closed up and were deserted, as if the entire industry had come to a sudden and grinding halt. The Ancient Persians The Persians were the very first global superpower. They made plenty of advancements in technology and architecture, but it was the sheer size of Persia and its great armies that really made it the world's first force to be reckoned with. It flourished for less than 500 years, even less time than Rome, and yet they left a lasting imprint on human history. Yes, the Romans conquered pretty much all of Europe, but the Persians did their conquering in a different way and in a different area. They stretched all the way from the eastern edge of the Mediterranean to India, and absorbed all the cultures in between. According to Taraj Darye, an expert in Persian studies at the University of California, Persia really was the first world empire. This was because it included within its kingdom parts of Africa, Asia, and Europe, a little piece of everywhere. Unlike Rome, Persia did not fall because they stretched themselves too thin. Rather, they destroyed themselves by going to war with Athens and Sparta, they lost the first invasion even though they vastly outnumbered their enemy, beaten back by the Spartans and the Athenians. When the Persians attacked again, they were repelled yet again. They had brought the biggest army ever seen to the doors of Greece, but just like their first endeavor, they were thrown back. And so, in 334 BC, it was no problem for Alexander the Great to squash the Persians once and for all. The Dilmun Civilization a recent archaeological dig in Bahrain has unveiled one of the oldest civilizations in human history. The dig was done at the site of Sar, where one of the earliest trading cultures dwelled thousands of years ago. Researchers believe Sar was home to the Dilmun civilization. The Dilmun society dates back to around 3000 BC, and Sar was a major trading post. The settlement can be divided into two parts, a residential zone and a small cemetery. Because of their strategic place in Bahrain, they would have had access to the trade coming in from the Indus Valley Civilization and from all the people of South Asia. This would have been like a connecting point, picking up goods from civilizations as far away as southern India, 
while also having access to lands in the north beyond Turkey. One of the things that makes this civilization so impressive is just how many cities they built. Sar is only one of many across much of Bahrain, and almost all of the other Dilmun cities were built to withstand invasion. They had huge pillars, outer walls that enclosed the entire city, and even built them over underground springs to provide fresh flowing water to everyone. Liangzhu Jade The Liangzhu archaeological site can be found in the Yangtze River Basin of China. A group of mysterious mounds were discovered back in 1936, and excavations over the next several decades revealed impressive burial complexes. These strange underground tombs were filled with ritual jade objects, ceremonial tools, and treasures made from stone and pottery. We now know that the people who dug these graves were from a Neolithic jade culture, identified by their early development of jade objects. Still, we don't exactly have a name for these people. They simply happen to be a group of early humans in China who were among the first to practice sophisticated jade craftsmanship. They then used their jade ornaments as decorations for tombs and as offerings during burial rituals. In fact, 75% of jade found has been inside burial mounds. The rest appears to have been reserved for royalty. For example, the jade trident plaque is an artifact totally unique to the Liangzhu culture. It's a remarkable headpiece that had once been attached to a crown, a three-pronged chunk of jade like Poseidon's helmet. As for what happened to the Liangzhu, they vanished around 2300 BC and were the very last of the Neolithic cultures in China. The Ancient Celts The Ancient Celts were the largest and most widespread group in ancient Europe. You probably hear the term Celt a lot, and it might make you think of Irish people or the British Celts from before the time of Christ. But in truth, the Celts were everywhere, from Britain to Russia. But the Celtic people never would have called themselves Celts. The name was given to them by the Greeks when they first came across people they took for barbarians in the year 540 BC. The Greeks called them Keltoi, and the name stuck for all the wild people outside of the Mediterranean region. Also, the Celts never shared a single kingdom or even a common goal. Instead, they were the most advanced collection of tribal chiefdoms in human history. There were hundreds upon hundreds of tribes across Europe, and although they didn't have a king and they didn't live in castles, they shared a single culture and a very distinct language. They were, for all intents and purposes, one people. This technically makes them the largest complex society in the ancient world. The Salado In the Tonto Basin in the United States, located in both Arizona and New Mexico, there was a great culture that flourished up until around 600 years ago. They were called the Salado culture, and they were around between 1200 and 1450 AD. Nobody knows exactly where they came from or where they went when they disappeared. That said, they were without a doubt the most advanced civilization to live in this dry and arid wasteland before Europeans. The Salado had very distinctive artwork. Their architecture was unlike anything else in the world, and their burial practices even separated them from the Anasazi. This is the biggest shock, since the Anasazi lived not too far away in Utah and on the other sides of Arizona and New Mexico. Yet the Salado and the Anasazi were wildly different, even with little land separating them. Humans were actually hunting mammoths in the Tonto Basin in 5000 BC, so the Salado definitely weren't the first people around. Also, indigenous groups built cliff dwellings here as far back as 3500 BC. Then, permanent occupation was made by the Mogollon people, and later the Hohokam, who lived in the basin right at the heart of what is now Phoenix, Arizona, for about 300 years. They fled around 1150, and the Salado came after. As you can see, there is a rich and diverse history here. It's highly probable the Salado are the most famous because they were the most recent. They built fantastic houses, cremated and buried their dead with great honors, and left behind some of the most artistic pieces of pottery of any native group. Sadly, they fled the area for unknown reasons in 1450, and nobody knows what became of them. The Hallstatt Culture The Hallstatt Culture is one you may have never heard of. 
most likely because they dominated a very small piece of Europe for a very small period of time. The culture is actually named after the Hallstatt archaeological site in Austria. They flourished here from between the 8th and 6th century BC, although they may have been there earlier in a more primitive capacity since 1200 BC. The Hallstatt are unique, though not as unique as some of the earlier cultures. They had a lot in common with other people in Europe during the Iron Age. These were proto-Celtic cultures. The one thing that really separates the Hallstatt from others is the reason behind their rise to power and their immediate fall from grace. They learned how to exploit natural resources with shocking efficiency. In particular, they realized how to pull salt from the earth and refine it for sale throughout Europe. They grew wildly wealthy just by trading salt. But then, around the year 500 BC, the salt ran out. They didn't have enough salt to stay in power, and rival trading centers were springing up everywhere in competition. Within just a few years, the Hallstatt culture was gone. King Montezuma King Montezuma had the extreme misfortune of being king of the Aztec when the Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés showed up in 1519. History has a strange way of changing narratives. According to the Spanish, King Montezuma immediately surrendered because he recognized the divine right of the Catholic Church. He supposedly understood that the Spanish people were permitted by God to occupy his lands and subjugate his citizens. But of course, that never happened at all. That was 16th century Spanish propaganda to justify the invasion and genocide that took place in the Aztec Empire. The truth is that Montezuma was a powerful leader. According to historian Buddy Levy, Montezuma was named king of Tenochtitlan in the year 1502. He was a respected military leader, and he grew the economy and status of the Aztec Empire within just a few short years. Even as the Aztecs suffered three years of brutal famine and multiple earthquakes, they prospered. When Cortés arrived in the capital of the Aztec, Montezuma kept a close watch on him. He had spies follow the Spanish around, and as Cortés plotted the destruction of the Aztec, Montezuma was plotting as well. But then, things took a nasty turn. Montezuma was captured and humiliated by the small Spanish force and made to hand over a huge chunk of gold. When Montezuma next faced his people, they were so furious at his weakness that they threw rocks at him and killed him. Juana of Castile Juana of Castile, known more plainly as Juana la Loca or Joan the Mad, was the Queen of Castile from 1504 and the Queen of Aragon from 1517 up until the time of her death. She was never supposed to wear a crown, and only did because of so many deaths in the family that happened in rapid succession. Most of the power was exercised for her by her father, Ferdinand II, her husband, Philip I, and her son, who became Emperor Charles V. As the third child and a daughter at that, she was not meant to rule, really, but to be married to an ally to protect Spain against France. Her brother died in 1497, followed by her older sister Isabella in 1498 after giving birth, and then her nephew passed away in 1500. These unfortunate events left her as the only heir to the throne, and when her mother died in 1504, she became queen. She was married to Philip of Burgundy, son of the Emperor Maximilian I. He was King of the Netherlands and later King Consort of Spain. While her family and connections were the most powerful in Europe, she didn't have much of an effect on politics and was always at the mercy of the arguments between her husband and her father. Even though she was the queen of one of the largest kingdoms in Europe, she was deemed mentally insane, and the many deaths in her family, as well as her husband's infidelity, may have pushed her over the edge. Historians believe she may have suffered from depression, schizophrenia, bouts of jealousy, and it's hard to know what was the truth and what was the result of her husband who locked her up and provoked her. He wanted to make her look incompetent so that he could take the throne instead. But Philip the Handsome died at the age of 28, and she wound up confined inside the royal convent of Santa Clara by her father, King Ferdinand II, until he died in 1516. Her son became one of the most powerful people in the world and inherited the thrones of Castile, Aragon, and the Duchy of Burgundy, as well as the Habsburg realms in Central Europe. He kept his mother locked up and refused her any visitors. While Juana was powerful by name and bloodline, her life was not so great. 
However, all of her children were highly successful, and her daughters went on to become queens all over Europe. She was the mother of the most powerful people of the day, Tiberius. Roman Emperor Tiberius ruled over Rome from between the years 14 and 37 BC. He was the adopted son of the far more famous Emperor Caesar Augustus. He never really wanted to become a vicious warlord like his dad, but his controlling mother Livia forced him into it. Tiberius never even wanted to be emperor. He enjoyed life prior to being forced into the political arena. He was a great general, he held a governorship in Gaul, and things were better for Tiberius out of the spotlight. But when it came to being emperor, he just didn't have a choice. His first few years ruling the entirety of the Roman Empire weren't great. That was in part because he gave much authority to the Senate. He wasn't interested in being overlord of everything, even though he could have been, and so he let the Senate work out most of the bureaucracy. Tiberius was such a lazy emperor that he didn't even finish most of the public works projects he started, and they weren't completed until much later by other emperors. Tiberius had an adopted son named Germanicus Julius, who most believed would have made a much better emperor. Sadly, Germanicus died after contracting an illness in the year 18. Following his adopted son's death, Tiberius grew strange. Between the years 18 and 26 AD, he tortured slaves and became wrathful against all of those who would oppose him. It eventually grew too much for him. He exiled himself to the Isle of Capri because being the Roman emperor had just proved too stressful. He stayed on the island until the year 37, when he died at 77 years old. Rollo, the Greatest Viking Rollo the Walker came down from Norway, raided the coastlines of France, laid siege to the city of Paris, and for his effort was made the first Duke of Normandy. His real name was Hrolf Ganger, and he may have been the greatest Viking who ever lived. Nobody knows exactly where Rollo came from. According to the ancient historian Dudo of St. Quentin, Rollo was Danish and led a group of Norwegian and Danish mercenaries. They went on expeditions to Scotland, Ireland, and England, then became rich through plundering. If the Icelandic sagas are to be believed, Rollo was the son of Count Ragnalf Eistensen, and he was so big and strong that no horse could carry him. Rollo besieged Paris sometime between 885 and 887. In the year 918, King Charles the Simple gave Rollo lands within the kingdom of West Francia, and this is the most interesting part of the story. Once Rollo was given these lands, he settled them officially. He adopted Christianity, his Viking comrades farmed the land, and they became the people known as the Normans. Normandy was the land given to the Vikings by France so they would stop murdering them. Rollo went on to have many children, and his descendants would go on to become members of royal houses all throughout Europe. Queen Cartimandua Cartimandua was queen of the Brigantes in the 1st century AD. She ruled as a powerful Celtic leader in Britain from between the years 43 and 69 AD. The Brigantes are not a very well-known people. They were a group of Celtic citizens living across northern England around what is Yorkshire today. In the days of tribal Britain, theirs was the biggest. Queen Cartamandua had the misfortune of coming into power right at the time the Romans invaded. Most of what we know about her comes not from British sources, but from the Roman historian Tacitus. He described her as a strong and influential leader and said she made several deals with the Romans to keep her position of power. But in the year 51 AD, things took a dangerous turn. The British king of the Catuvelauni tribe, Caratacus, was leading a resistance against the Romans. He launched successful attacks and was defeated, then sought sanctuary with the Brigantes. This could have been bad for the queen, but she had her own power in mind. She realized how big a force Rome was and just how dangerous they were. So when King Caratacus came for her help, she put him in chains and handed him straight over to the Romans. This was a double-edged sword because it earned her favor with the invaders, but made her unpopular with the Celts, her own people. The Celts became so furious by many of the moves she made to secure her power that they rebelled against her. The Celts were squashed by the Romans during the rebellion, but the queen managed to slip away to a Roman fort at Deva, and her ultimate end is unknown. Would you rather marry a king or a queen or be the greatest fighter in the world? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. William Walker 
William Walker did not begin his life as any kind of leader. He was a small man, no more than 5 feet, and he weighed only about 120 pounds. Walker did not look like a military man or a brave adventurer. But the Tennessee-born native would grow to be one of the most successful Americans in the 19th century. He believed it was the destiny of the United States of America to stretch down into Mexico and claim all of Central America. The issue for William was that he had no real power. What he did have was money. He had enough money that in the 1850s, he purchased a private army and invaded Mexico twice. When Mexico turned out to be way too big to conquer, William Walker took his private army to Nicaragua and he declared himself as the president. During this time, Nicaragua was in the midst of a civil war. One of the fighting parties, the Liberals, agreed to grant William Walker colonist status and give him land grants if he could help defeat the conservatives. After a bit of heavy fighting, Walker and his mercenaries took the fortress at Granada and beat back the conservatives. He then made himself the head of the Nicaraguan military, chased the president out of the country, and declared himself the ruler in 1856. Even the U.S. president of the time, Franklin Pierce, recognized Walker as the leader of the country. The first thing William Walker did as president was make the national language English and legalize slavery. This insanity went on until September 12th of 1860, when Walker was captured by Hondurans and executed by firing squad. Empress Carlota of Mexico Empress Carlota of Mexico was born in Belgium on June 7th of 1840 and was known originally as Princess Charlotte. She was the daughter of Leopold I, King of Belgium. She was also the first cousin of Queen Victoria, and oddly enough the cousin of Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, as well. When she was only 16, Charlotte met Emperor Maximilian, who was in his mid-twenties at the time. You may not be surprised to hear this, but Maximilian was also Charlotte's cousin. The princess married the emperor in 1857. They lived in Italy but fled in 1859 when the Italian War for Freedom had begun. Around this time, Napoleon III was busy trying to conquer Mexico. The idea was to impose a monarchy in Mexico that would answer directly to France. The man for the job was Emperor Maximilian and his wife, who changed her name to the Spanish Carlota just before they arrived in Mexico in 1864. Immediately, Maximilian and Carlota were proclaimed the Emperor and Empress of Mexico. However, France was losing the war. They were already being beaten by the United States, nationalism was on the rise, and there was simply no room for a monarchy in Mexico. For a second, Carlota ruled one of the greatest empires in the world. But after the American Civil War was over, the U.S. backed Mexico against France, and that was the end of any monarchy in the country. Napoleon withdrew his troops, and Maximilian refused to leave. On June 19, 1867, he was captured and executed. Carlota was whisked back to Belgium, where she lived in seclusion for the next 60 years of her life, reportedly going completely insane. She passed away on January 19, 1927, at the ripe old age of 86. King David I King David I of Scotland was born in the year 1084, and while there have been quite a lot of powerful Scottish rulers, David I was the only one who fundamentally transformed Scotland. He laid down the very foundations for what would become Scottish territory. His father was Malcolm III and his mother was Queen Margaret, who became a saint after she died. David's uncle, Donald III, took the throne when David's father died. David wouldn't get it back until 1124 with help from King Henry I of England. But once David was in power, he began changing the country forever. One of the most important things he did was build. He commissioned many monasteries across Scotland and encouraged a change in the way the local people worshipped God. He also founded Scotland's own currency and brought Anglo-Norman influences to Scotland through feudalism. In other words, he made Scotland modern. Then, at the Battle of Clitheroe in June of 1138, the Scottish beat the English and won their independence. The only place David failed was in northern Scotland, where the Norse still had a strong grip and refused to give up the Highlands. Queen Sindyak Queen Sindyak is the most famous queen in Korean history. She was the ruler of Silla, one of the three main kingdoms of Korea in the 7th century. She was the 27th ruler of Silla, the very first ruling queen, and was monumentally important to the unification of Korea. 
Just like China and Japan, Korea wasn't always united under one banner. The Three Kingdoms period lasted from 57 BC until 668 AD, with the country split into three parts. Just decades after Queen Seon Deok's death, Silla would defeat the other two kingdoms. This would finally bring the Korean peninsula under one flag for the first time in history. The only reason Seon Deok became queen was because of her father, King Jin Pyong, who had been ruling for 40 years and only managed to have three daughters, but no sons. She was the first in line and the only qualified person to rule the Silla dynasty because of her pure blood. Starting in 634, she became the ruler of Silla. Much to the surprise of the people, who didn't believe a woman could rule anything, she did a whole lot of good. She ushered in a renaissance of literature and art, one so powerful it had a profound impact on the kingdom. She used a level head to stop Silla from devolving into civil war and anarchy like the neighboring kingdoms were. The other two dynasties eventually ripped each other apart from the inside, and because of this, the Silla took over all of Korea. William the Conqueror William the Conqueror was one of the greatest leaders the world has ever seen. His great-great-great-grandfather was Rollo the Viking, the legendary Viking raider who pillaged France in the 9th century. And while we call him William the Conqueror today, he was known most of his life as William the Bastard. He was born following an affair between Robert I of Normandy and a woman named Herleva of no renowned family. In France, William was only a duke. He invaded England in 1066 because he believed the English throne belonged to him through his ancestry. It was a fantastic invasion, and he defeated King Harold II at the Battle of Hastings. This ushered in a new era in British history. After the great victory at Hastings, William marched his army into London, subdued the city, and crowned himself the first Norman King of England on Christmas Day, 1066. He was crowned in Westminster Abbey and thus ended the Anglo-Saxon period in England. French became the national language, and the Normans ruled the British Isles up until the Anglo-French War of 1202 to 1214. Thanks for watching! Who is your favorite ruler from history? Let me know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe and come back soon for more videos on ancient history. See you later! Bye!